Okay, so um, what I want to talk about now is um, a particular study that I've been working on, I'm still working on actually, uh, which, uh, which is not, not published, you know, this is work in progress, it's at, hopefully at a fairly late stage in progress, but it is work in progress that I'm going to talk about. Um, and it's, uh, as you can see, with two co-authors, Luigi Grassi and Sven Heim. And the question is, what's the impact of the German response to the Fukushima earthquake? Um, and in a sense, I will say that, that there is another aspect to it where, where we get a sort of advanced vision of the European energy future. So, uh, now why, why study the German response to the Fukushima earthquake rather than the Japanese response? Well, I would say that Germany reacted strongly, but of course it wasn't directly affected. And so, it's a nice thing to study. I mean, it was obviously horrible for the people in Japan, and I'm not going to talk about that at all, but it was, it's a nice thing to study. Um, so what was the effect on Germany? Well, Germany had a, a very strong reaction. So Fukushima takes place on the 11th of March. I think it was a Friday. Um, but Germany decides Le oh, just about a week later, 18th of March, to shut down six nuclear power plants. Uh, plus, sometimes people say seven or eight, it depends on quite what, how you count them, because there was one which was out of operation, another one which was temporarily out of operation. So sometimes people say six, sometimes people say eight. But this is a big impact. Um, there's a picture from the German press mm -hmm. at the time, uh, swatting out the nuclear power stations. So, actually Germany was heavily dependent on nuclear power. Uh, sorry. So I wonder how German specific this is, because wouldn't this involve fully modeling the political economy of Germany? Because you could make the argument that the German situation is a story in which there was already a strong anti-nuclear movement and you have different groups fighting so that what you have is you imagine that what happened before Fukushima was an equilibrium but what Fukushima does is it becomes a focal point to yeah. push it so yeah no I I exactly John I, I think I think you can certainly make that argument and um, so I how it, how can you generalize to anything well um, I'm not going to generalize much but but uh, but I, I'm saying that, that it's a nice experiment in the sense of seeing what happens when something suddenly changes. Uh, and we do also, it, it is also a sudden movement uh, to, which gives an indication of what happens when we move to a more renewable based future. And, and moreover, there is a country just to the west of it that has 80% nuclear power. So in a way, you're not really shutting off if you're interconnected, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, and, and I'll take account of that, yeah. Um, so Germany was heavily dependent on nuclear power. It, it, it was, um, in 2010, 22% of German production was in nuclear plants. Um, but then they shut uh, six of these down, that's 6.3 gigawatts. That's 4% of total capacity and 7% of total non-intermittent capacity that, they, that was shut down suddenly. Um, and so as a result, you get a big decrease in production from nuclear sources. So from 22% by 2012, you're down to 16%. Uh, or 2011, actually, you've gone down further still. So this was unanticipated and significant. Um, and you can see it in the picture. Uh, you see this sudden change in Germany. Um, 
at this point in time, you suddenly move down in terms of how much nuclear power was produced. And so what we're going to look at is the effect this had. And I would argue this is a natural experiment. It's a natural experiment in the sense that not, sorry, not in the sense that they were never going to shut these plants down, but in the sense that if the accident hadn't happened, they wouldn't have shut them down at that point in time. They were planning to shut them down, and, but, but not at that point in time. Um, and so it has a big impact on the proportions in which fuels are used. That's the impact that it has. Um, and so because it actually led to an increase, or because uh, as a result of this, there was an increase in renewables used in production, at the same time, you can see what's going to happen. You remember in the previous thing, I put a picture of Britain and Germany. You can see, to some extent, what's going to happen as countries move to more renewables. What's, what's the... I mean, obviously, this is institution-specific. Germany has specific institutions by which it runs its system, which do matter. But you can get some insight into the impact. Um, and you can also get an, impact, an idea of how the German decision affected the other countries. Because, um, as you say, Alex, um, Germany is interconnected, but, so it actually affects the other countries. And we, to some extent, we trace that in this paper. Um, and so it, it does look at the degree of integration between European countries. Um, now, if you weren't sort of careful about this, you might say, well, okay, no problem. Why? Well, because Germany at the time, through policy decisions, was adding heavily to the amount of, new, of uh, renewables. Um, they, particularly solar, actually, they've, they've had huge growth in solar from tiny to quite significant. And actually, as you can see, over the period between 2010, and, which was obviously before the thing, and 2012, afterwards, there's this enormous increase in capacity of wind, and particularly of solar. And so you might say, OK, no problem. More capacity um, added than was taken away. But, of course, that wouldn't be thinking very carefully because um, although those things are a big, big amount of installed capacity, they're not used nearly as intensively, or they're not useful nearly as intensively as other things. So whereas a typical nuclear plant is used around about 75% of the time, you know, the solar wind is in the 10 to 15%, because obviously it's not, so, it's not sunny at night, Sometimes it's not sunny during the day. It's not very sunny in the winter. Uh, it's only windy, windy at certain times, um, and so on. So those things are very dependent on, on these natural events. And so whereas um, the, the power that was taken out by the closure of the nuclear plants would have produced 58 terawatt hours over a typical year, the renewables only produce about 10 and a half terawatt hours. So there's a big change in the amount of uh, production as a result of this. So that's, that's quite an important thing that's happening. You're moving. Ger Germany was and still is a big net exporter of electricity. Uh, but it's moving from a situation where it's got a pretty dependable power supply to a much less dependable power supply. You, you, uh, much less, I should say, much less biddable power supply. You can, you know, the system can bid onto and get 
largely speaking, conventional power, but, but not the unconventional power. So if I understand, just tell me, just clarify this. Are you basically sort of saying it takes seven times as much renewable capacity to, ma to, to produce roughly the same amount of terawatt hours per hour as, as nuclear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Now that's useful clarification, yeah. Uh, I've already had that picture. So, so the questions I'm going to look at are, firstly, what's the impact in terms of potential disruption to supply and in terms of price movements? And, you know, it could have been, some people said beforehand, it could have been that, that the system would collapse. Um, in fact, as we'll see, it didn't collapse. Uh, they were able to meet demand. Um, but it also comes out, obviously, in price movements, and we can get a pretty precise calculation of this. Um, we can also look, as I say, at what happened to Germany's neighbours. Um, and so we've essentially used fairly conventional techniques. Um, it's obviously going to be more broad brush in terms of Germany's neighbours because you know, Sven is an expert on uh, the German power system, but none of us is an expert on the Dutch power system or the Danish power system. And so, you know, we, we only look at those in a broad brush sort of way. Um, so, it's a fairly standard model. Um, I'll talk about some of the bits in a bit more detail, some of the aspects of the model in a bit more detail. Um, but this is a fairly general model, so, but with some nuances. So, um, it's a bit like the model that I put up previously, a standard model. Demand is a function of price, uh, industrial production, uh, temperature, daylight, um, to time of year, time of day, etc. There is a time trend. Um, I should say, as regards the time trend, that the time trend actually captures two or three things altogether that we can't identify because they change year. We only know, measure them year by year. But there are two or three things that change over every year. Um, on the supply side, um, price, fuel price, is it gone? Fuel prices, that is coal, gas, uh, and also carbon, which is important, the cost of carbon. Um, renewables, the production of renewables, imports and exports. Um, we also take account of river levels and river temperatures. Why? Because if river levels are low, you can produce less run of river hydro. If river temperatures are high, you have to start phasing down conventional power stations because it makes the water too warm. Um, and again, um, you've got um, various calendar dummies, uh, and you've also got things to do with interconnection, and I'll spend a little bit of time on interconnection later on. But naturally, we assume supply equals demand equals load, and so um, we've, but I can, see, <laughs> I can see that there's a problem here because I've used both L and V to mean the same thing, load and volume. Um, so you can, you can write an equation for load or volume, and you can also write an equation for price. And there are things that affect one that don't affect the other in both cases. Um, so, what are the factors affecting the supply schedule in a bit more depth? Um, obviously, if coal prices, gas prices, or carbon prices go up, they're likely to influence it positively. Um, now, the way that, this is important, the way that renewables come in in Germany is that they work on a must-run basis. And so, if it's windy, the system has to take the wind. If it's sunny, the system has to take the sun. 
And so, I mean, they needn't necessarily work like that. They could be constrained off, but they do work like that. And therefore, you can simply subtract them from the rest of the load. Um, what we're actually measuring is not actual on the day. We're, we're looking at the day ahead market, so it's forecasted. So it's forecasted wind that matters, forecasted sun, forecasted load, forecasted day ahead prices for gas, coal, etc. etc. Um, so forecasted generation from wind and solar reduces the clearing price because there's a lower residual load. Uh, river water, as I've said. Um, oh yeah, we've got, clearly we've got to include for the possibility of there being market power in generation. And uh, we do that in a particular way that I'll explain later. Um, and we include factors to do with interconnectors. So um, this took Sven a lot of time, actually. Um, as I've said, there are many interconnectors between Germany and other countries. There are actually two with Denmark. Uh, as one, there's Poland, Czechoslovakia, um, Austria, France, Switzerland, um, not Belgium, I believe, but, but the Netherlands. Um, Germany is, is very interconnected. What matters on these interconnectors is really the capacity of the interconnector. So we're interconnected to France. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I know. I know that there is an indirect interconnection, and there is talk of a direct interconnection. But, but, but currently, um, and so the interconnectors, the way these work, they, well, they work under a variety, and this is the problem, they work under a variety of protocols. But the interconnectors, uh, essentially, the most common system is a sort of auction system. So based on, and essentially they work on arbitrage basis. You know, if there's a big enough gap between the prices in one country and another, then the electricity flows so as to reduce that gap. But the interconnectors do have constraints on them. They're, they're only small. Uh, and luckily, for our purposes, they are all small relative to the size of Germany, relative to the size of the German power market. So from the German point of view, we treat them as... Uh, essentially exogenous. Um, for some of the other markets, which are much smaller, they may have a significant effect on prices, but we, we view them as small. It, the biggest one is about 1.5% of the German market, so they, we view them as, as um, exogenous as far as the German market is concerned. Um, so if interconnectors are congested, then imports or exports, as the case may be, will be curtailed. Um, and so prices won't be moderated. So what data we've got? Well, we've got data, data on an hourly basis from January the 1st, in other words, the first hour of January the 1st, 2009, to the very last hour of, January, of December the 31st, 2012, which is a nice period. It's a lot of data around about 32,000 observations, um, of which slightly over a half are before and slightly less than half are afterwards, obviously. Uh, that is on day ahead spot prices, um, aggregated hourly load for Germany and Austria. Um, Austria, this is interesting. Germany, uh, an, an exception to this thing about congestion is that Germany and Austria are completely interconnected. It's, it's as if the Germ Germanic language was extended to the power system, that, that they operate as one market. Um, whoops, yeah, I think that's, yeah. yeah. On the demand side, industrial production for Germany and Austria, obviously that's not hourly. Um, uh, but we do have temperatures, and temperature is one of the most important influences on electricity demand, actually. Um, I've also studied gas markets, and temperature is almost a perfect predictor, for, in a nonlinear way, 
of demand uh, for gas. But it's still a good predictor for, for electricity. And we got, so we've got hourly temperatures. We've got hourly temperatures for a range of places, all the major places around Germany, aggregated, by, were weighted by population size. And indeed, we've also got temperatures, daily temperatures, rather than hourly, for the neighboring countries. Um, and you can use temp temperature always interacts, it, it always affects demand non-linearly. We do do this in two different ways. One is a quadratic, the other is um, using cooling degree days and heating degree days. Um, so obviously cooling degree days are if the, if the temperature gets um, too warm to work properly and you need to start cooling, particularly in factories, not so much in homes. Um, within Britain, uh, well, within Germany, uh, heating degree days if it gets too cold. Um, daylight. Now, the, the daylight variable, obviously there are some parts of the day which are daylight all the year round. Um, other parts of the day which are never daylight. The important bits are the parts where it's daylight some of the year and not daylight other parts of the year. Um, and there's a trend, and as I say, the trend unfortunately absorbs a number of things. Uh, it would be nice to be able to separate them out, but that, since they only change annually, you can't. Uh, one is that there is a trend in efficiency, uh, which is only measured annually. There's also, and this is quite important for Germany, there is a trend in the, what they call the EEG, or they probably say it slightly differently, but EEG, which is the um, surcharge that consumers pay uh, on the price which is to do with renewables. Um, so that's obviously going to affect things, but it only affects things on an annual basis because it's only changed on an annual basis. Um, so we've got the hourly sum of wind and solar generation, um, and um, because these, as I say, are constrained on, they've got 20 years of fixed feed-in tariffs and priority feed into the grid regardless of demand. They've got a very good deal, the renewable power producers in Germany. This is all part of the German uh, green movement, really, the importance of the green movement in Germany. Um, and so the transmission service operator is obliged to offer the renewables for the lowest price at the exchange. Um, it shifts, it clearly, since they're always bid in, it shifts the merit order. You think of that merit order curve, it's moving it back and forth as wind and solar come in or not. Um, and so it more decreases the spot price or um, and that's, given the current system, that's exogenous. Um, so we've got supply price variables. Now, one of the potential problems with supply price variables is whether they are endogenous. What we use is import prices which come from European markets. So Germany is quite a large country, but it's not a huge part of the European market, so we use import prices for hard coal and for gas. For the same reason, we don't use, the Germans use quite a lot of brown coal in production, but that's obviously endogenous to the system because they're the only ones that... Um, so we use the import price indexes for hard coal and gas. We use a carbon price index, which is obviously Europe-wide. Um, we've got daily data on river day levels and river temperatures, um, and so we're able to create indices from that. Um, congestion indices, because this is day ahead all the time, this is anticipated um, price differences between countries as a result of interconnection constraints. Um, but as I said, the, the, all of these countries bar Austria, uh, they, well, all the countries are relative, are 
a relatively small part that can, sorry, the interconnectors are relatively small compared to the size of the German market. Um, and so we've got, we produce an index based on aggregated interconnector variables. Um, and these actually vary, they, they vary more often than you might think for various reasons which are, are probably too complex for me to understand, but the capacity of the interconnectors actually varies hourly, um, and so these were gathered. I, I think it's, it's, it's um, something to do with, in, a, in an electrical system, if you get too many flows at one time in one direction, um, the system tends to sort of slow down and you have to put power deliberately in at another point in order to stop that. It, it's what's called reactive power. And I think it's to do with the reactive power. But that's, you know, that, that's a sort of step beyond, uh, really. Um, and so we argue that these congestion indices are essentially exogenous. Market power. Market power is clearly not exogenous, and we'll instrument for it. The way we measure market power is through something called the residual supply index. This is a common way to do it in, uh, in electricity. Uh, and the sort of argumentation is this. There are a number of power companies, and what matters is whether Absent your power, the system would be able to supply everything that would be needed. If you imagine a power company, um, it, it's a bit like, I think of it, other people don't, but I think of it a bit like um, a, an Edgeworth version of a Bertrand model. If put together, everyone else has enough power to supply the system at a given price, then you have very little market power. Yeah. It makes me think of the Shapley value in negotiations, R something yeah. like this. Is that, is that what it is supposed um, to do? Or? Well, not, not really. I, I would say it, it's, it's more, you know, you can imagine, um, if I draw a picture, I'll, sh I'll show you what I mean. Um, as I say, other people think of it slightly differently, but... So, um, supposing that at, at any one p period in time, I've obviously exaggerated the slope of the demand curve, that other people are capable of supplying more than the, than, uh, the market, then price will equal marginal cost. Whereas if you're in a position where you're needed, um, then if everyone else supplied all they had, there would still be some left over over which you could be a monopolist. Um, uh, hmm? Yeah, the marginal monopolist, exactly, yes. Yeah, and so um, yeah, the, the company that's most likely to be in this position is RWE, which is the largest German producer. Uh, and RWE is not very often, but from time to time, is in that position. And so the residual supply index is a way of capturing that effect. Uh, and this turns out, I mean, the, other people have different argumentation, but, but this turns out uh, to be um, a, an index which is commonly used in this market rather than something like the learner index um, because of the way that we, in which the market works. But it is, as I say, endogenous. Um, and I won't go into the details of the measure, but, but actually um, it, it works best if, if you don't do it exactly but, but if you use a value which is slightly different from one. Um, now, this is um, 
a, a summary table of the data we've got with the, with the various um, means and so on. Um, I don't want to pick up my, out much from this, and in any case, um, you won't be able to see much of it, but the, as I say, that we've got 35,000 observations. There is a clear difference in price pre-Fukushima and post-Fukushima. Um, load is actually fairly constant across the time period. Uh, renewables grow rapidly, etc., etc. Um, so a fairly standard empirical model. Um, we, we tried various linear and non-linear formulations, and I'll just talk about some examples from a fairly straightforward version. Um, so obviously we've got to instrument for price, uh, for which we use fuel prices, carbon prices, and the log of forecast of renewables. Um, we've got to instrument for consumption or load, temperature, temperature squared, industrial production, daylight hours. Um, we've got to instrument for um, the residual supply index, which we use available capacity and the square of available capacity. Um, the model inevitably, like most electricity models, suffers from things like heteroscedasticity and serial correlation, uh, which we deal with in fairly standard ways. Um, and we can demonstrate that the instruments are valid. So um, this table is um, like others, although John told us not to, too small for most people to see. However, <laughs> I have blown up the key piece of information, so hopefully you can see it. Can you see that bit at the top, John? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no. no, you're being naughty now, Alex. <laughs> this one, I mean, here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the... What this, is, this is a series of supply-side estimations. I haven't put everything onto here, but this is a series of supply-side estimations where we try, where we put in various bits. So obviously you can have a fairly straightforward one. Um, you can add in um, things for congestion and so on. And, and that's the one we take as the standard one. And there the effect is 3.263, what on earth does that mean? Well, the average price is around 44, so this is around 7%, so there's about a 7% price uplift as a result of the uh, decision. Uh, if you, you can't see these, but if you um, include the residual supply index, then that figure goes down somewhat, but actually that's what you would expect because part of the impact of the uh, decision to re remove these plants, part of the impact is to, is to reduce the capacity margin. And therefore, as you would expect, RWE is more often in a position where it has market power. And so if you include the market power index, that um, then the headline figure goes down. But, but that's what you would expect. So clearly there is an effect on price. Um, now, that's just the average effect on price. If I was to ask you, when would it become most apparent, what would you say? Uh, well, uh, sort of forgetting about the RSI thing, but, yeah, that, that's a possibility, but, uh, yeah. When, when would you expect to see the biggest effect? High demand periods, or...? No? Okay. Anyone else? Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed to think here. <laughs> 
that's what I, no, uh, what? Maybe right at the beginning? Um, possibly, that's another possibility. Um, actually, the f first way that I thought is the way that Kern thought. But actually, it turns out not to be true. And it comes out in this picture, th this diagram. If you look between high demand and low demand, actually, the main effect is when there's low demand. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, it, of course, if you look at it, if you just split it up another way between seasons, there's a bigger effect in the winter, but you would expect that anyway. Um, and and if, then if you split it up by both of these, mostly the effect, oh, you can't see those definitely, but mostly the effect is at times of low demand in each season, although there is some evidence, depending on functional form, of an impact in the winter also. Now the question is, why is that? Now as I said, it's a low, it, the biggest effect is at low demand times, why is that? <laughs> because of the merit order changes because the nuclear dumping out yeah uh, yeah yeah that, that's right yeah that's the answer yeah the answer is that it's because uh, the what you've taken out is base load Actually, the biggest effect, if you divide it up by hours of the day, the biggest effect is at around about three in the morning. Because at that time, you know, well, obviously there's no sun, but at that time, if the effect of taking out nu some nuclear base load is that you have to start running some coal plant in order to satisfy demand, whereas previously you didn't. And so, actually, the big effect is... Uh, at, at the time at which you first of all wouldn't think it happened. But if that's true, it's not about base load per se, it's about the difference because of the merit order between nuclear and the next thing in the yes. base load. Yes, exactly. So that's what's really driving yes. it. If there were a big, if there were no difference between, in other words, if the marginal change in the base load were minor, yeah. then the effect would be in high peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. No, so, so actually, um, it's, it's just that it turns out that way uh, in Germany. Uh, in in, in some, somewhere else it might not turn out that way. But it turns out that way for a combination of reasons. One is that it's never sunny at night, and the other, which is when the low demand is, and the other is that, that you've removed this base load. And so you've taken something away and you never add any, or very, only if it's very windy, do you add something in. So on average, it, the biggest effect is at night. So, uh, in technical yeah? In a technical way, the supply curve shifted, but it's only the lower part that shifted. The yes. upper part is the yeah. same. And yeah, that's, that, uh, that's right, yes. If you it's a bit difficult to draw it, but, but you know, if you imagine a supply curve, If this is the supply curve before, then what you've done is you've shifted it like this. And if, so you've moved from maybe a situation like this, where you were there, to a, to a position like that. And it doesn't matter so much when you're further out, but... Uh, Mike, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm misreading this, but if this is the case, that the base load effects are so different, isn't this an argument for the importance of nuclear power? That it's, it's in some sense, I don't know, efficient, because if there's no close substitute in the base load because yeah. of the merit order, yeah. let me put it this way, if it were less important, then the marginal effect of removing it shouldn't matter in low demand. Mm. But the yeah. fact that it matters in high demand is essentially telling me that all my alternatives are so much worse 
that you notice it even in low demand periods, yeah. which is an yeah. argument against using renewables. So it's an extra cost of renewables above as a substitute, above and beyond yeah. what the normal one, because there's this yeah. issue of base yeah. load substitution. Uh, and and I, I, actually, no, that, that is, that is uh, essentially the story. Uh, and actually, there's, there's another factor which is important, which I, which I haven't um, uh, pointed out, but actually solar is very good for Germany in one sense, that the Germans like a big midday meal. <laughs> okay, so actually there's a peak in demand at lunchtime. That's relatively unusual by European standards, but, but there's, there is a big peak in demand at lunchtime. That's when solar is really good. Okay, and so solar has actually flattened that lunchtime peak, and so it works with the system. It, but the, um, particularly in the winter, but at, at all times, the variance of the system increases. Uh, as a result of the move away from nuclear towards renewables, and that's what's driving it. But, but Mike, that's damning with faint praise. Mm. That's like sort of saying there's a, there's a beach nearby that's only used in the summer, mm. so building a freeway mm. that goes there and yeah. is not used 90% yeah. of the year, but that is fully used in one month of the year at a cost that far exceeds some alternative method of transportation. Yeah. Mm. It makes yeah. it. No, it, it, it is, I think, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter because the citizens pay for the highway because they have preferences for a beach. Yeah. A, that's exactly the story. Yeah. They, they want green energy and they, they pay for it, the households. Yeah. But the, the preference is for the type of highway, not for the beach. That's exactly the point. It's more as if, imagine that the railroad were efficient or cars were efficient, but they instead insist on an escalator or they insist on a moving walkway. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, on the demand side, the, 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 um, the main thing uh, which, um, which you can't really pick out, but the main thing is that, and uh, this is quite important, is that demand is not statistically significantly, in, or rather load, is not statistically significantly influenced by the uh, decision to take these plants out. So in other words, all the impact was on price, really, and essentially no measurable impact on load. Now, that's quite interesting because, and it might not be true of other countries, but it means that you can you know, have quite a big shift in, um, in, in what happens, uh, quite a big reduction in capacity without widespread shortages. Um, but you, you, the price you pay is a relatively higher price. So no appreciable effect of the shock on demand. Uh, the demand's otherwise very conventional, and uh, you know it, it, it looks really nice when you look at the statistics. You know the the uh, peak effect of temperature is really at the right point. Significant overall positive impact on price varies by season, by peak non-peak, greatest in the off-peak altogether. This is due to the quietest base load no longer being completely served by nuclear. Now I want to say a little bit about the broader European impact. So this was a German decision, but remember Germany is quite interconnected. Um, and you know, the European Commission is very keen on interconnection. Um, just before you do that, it was there, it, did you look at whether there's been more outages? Um, the, the, well, I th if there were more outages, if they were of any significance, then we would have picked them up. Uh, and there's no indication in the, in the load data that there were significant outages. There may have been very minor small ones, but, but largely speaking, the system, you know, there's nothing that you can measure. Be because you would think that the system would become more fragile and you it know, does, just picking it, it, is, it does become more fragile, yes. Uh, and um, the, uh, I mean, I think Germany was relatively lucky in this, in, the, in that being a big exporter of power, traditionally, uh, it was, you know, by just decreasing that, the extent to which it exports, uh, it, it, uh, it can largely tackle that problem. 
The way in which it, it potentially can't tackle the problem is that um, you know, the, the wind and the, and the sun is not in the same place as the tradi traditional power plant, so it does need to strengthen, as demand increases, it does need to strengthen the transmission network. And that's, that's a relatively slow process because it involves a lot of planning and discussion with neighborhoods and so on. Um, but, but, the, um, but you know, largely speaking, they, they managed to run the system uh, despite its increased fragility uh, without significant impact. Um, anyway, what about the broader European impact? Well, as I say, that this is an important policy issue because uh, Europe wants to increasingly integrate all the power markets. Um, and clearly there are benefits to this. Whether the benefits exceed the costs is not not obvious, but there are clearly benefits to this, and people emphasize the benefits, because of, um, you know, essentially just adding more things reduces the variance. It's, it's, it's a simple variance cancelling sort of argument. Um, but this is a unilateral decision, and the question is, has it had an impact on neighboring countries? Uh, and so what we look at here are the the impact on the direct connections with the Netherlands, France, etc., etc. Uh, and the way that we do this is, as I say, a more broad brush technique than what we did in Germany. In Germany, we spent a lot of try time trying to understand the system and trying to understand the nuance of it, nuances of it and getting very detailed data. Uh, we only have relatively broad brush data on the, European, the other European countries. Um, and essentially, so essentially we run a, a sort of variable um, vector autoregressive process using daily rather than hourly data, uh, and we include um, uh, simplified versions of our variables. And I'm sure that there are things in each of these different countries that are probably different from the precise way we've modeled it, but this is not meant to be as precise an exercise as in uh, Germany. Um, uh, yeah. uh, now, the main thing that I go... So the main thing that we're looking at is did the German decision have an impact on the other countries' prices? And the answer is, yes, it did. Um, it had an effect on Switzerland, on the Netherlands. They, these vary in size, but they, they're pretty constant in sign in Denmark in the west and Denmark in the east. When you look at Denmark by itself on the map, by the way, if you don't have any other countries, it's a very funny shape. It's, it's, you, it would be almost impossible to describe its shape. It's such a funny sort of country. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it has separate bits of the west and east. Uh, uh, in France, in Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, not actually, the impact in Poland is not significant, but all the others um, are measured as significant. Um, and so, actually, this German decision, which was a unilateral decision, has an impact on all these other countries. They all um, are negatively affected by the German decision. And so the overall implications, and, and I'll draw out a few, few further implications for this. Overall, 7% price increase in the German and Austrian market. Now, notice, by the way, that Aus I didn't, Austria wasn't in the, pr the table that I've just put up because Austria is completely interconnected. So the Austrians ha have the positive and negative benefits of um, just being faced by the full effect of the German decision. And so prices go up by 7% on average. Uh, by the way, when I talk about average here, 
Um, that was based on that coefficient, of the individual coefficient, but if you look at the separate coefficients of the, um, you know, the, if you break it down, then it always works out to be the roughly the same. If you see these results, what comes to mind with, uh, to me is a metaphor with the banking system. So mm. there you have these interconnections and you have this robust yet fragile property. If you have shock to the system, it's getting distributed to the interconnectors yeah. and it diminishes the shock, but the others feel it. However, one wonders if the shock is really large, whether it's actually going to increase the vulnerability of the whole European system. Yeah, actually, I think there is, there is some concern about that. Uh, and the reason is that, that, largely speaking, these are AC interconnectors. Um, I, th I think the one with Belgium will be a DC interconnector. But now there, there's, a, there's an important factor to here. Um, these AC interconnectors, alternating current interconnectors, um, they, power will flow. Um, and so if something suddenly goes wrong, that, that has a widespread effect on the system. You can't sort of, in a sense, sort of suddenly shut it off. And, um, and, and this has happened actually in Europe, that uh, it happened in Italy, North Italy. Something went slightly wrong in Switzerland. This was about well, five or six years ago. Something went slightly well, wrong in Switzerland and the whole of the northern, <laughs> north of Italy went out as a result. Uh, so DC interconnectors don't, direct current interconnectors don't face this issue because you can just switch them off. But, but so in the end, so we're doing these reforms, inside countries, the cushions go down. Then we say we can solve this by interconnectors and having European cushions. But of course, if all European countries do the same, the system-wide cushions go down. Yeah. And then in the long run, the whole system is going to turn out more vulnerable. How do you protect yourself from that? Or well, yeah, I mean, uh, there are... So, um, as I say, I, I, would, I would advocate more DC interconnection to separate out into separate areas somewhat. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I mean, obviously there are ways of starting the system up again. And, you know, and every country has its own set of markets, actually, which do that. So, um, you know, but, I mean, I'm just talking about the market as if there was one market. There are actually many markets. You know, there's a market for what that call, that's called. There is a market for Black Start. Uh, which is generators which have the capability of starting the system up again in a synchronous way. It has to be synchronous. Um, and then you have, you have other markets for, say, what, what the Germans call minute reserve, you know, very quick power. You know, but these are a whole series of markets that are constructed uh, in every country. Uh, and you have... You have um, firms that are willing to switch off uh, when, when the system is looking fragile, so that, um, and they're paid for that. So, you know, there's a whole system of people being paid for various things. Um, I have a question about the 7%. Um, how did the prices um, develop in other countries? Right. In comparison. So, so in Austria, of course, it's seven percent. In the others, it's it's somewhat naturally somewhat attenuated, and the you can't compare directly with those VAR estimates, but but the um, the effect would be um, you know, on average about half that I would say in other in the other countries. Uh, but they it it did clearly have an effect on all, all, almost all those interconnected countries. Um, so, if we try and evaluate that, um, what it, if you turn it into money terms, the effect is around one and a half billion euro in Germany per year. It's actually also about 0.2 billion in Austria, which doesn't sound very much, but then Austria is quite a small country. And so, for each Austrian, it's, I think I calculated it's something like um, 
um, you know, two euros a week or something. Um, impact, as I said, <laughs> impact, as I say, highest in times with low demand, um, so they're matching well with peak demand. Um, now, one of the interesting implications of this, if the impact is highest in times of low demand, there's a decrease in the spread between off-peak and peak. And that has some implications which are not immediately obvious. I don't know whether anyone can think of any implications of that. Yeah. Well, it means that if, you know, one way one way that you can insulate yourself from these fluctuations is by creating storage. Uh, storage is in, is in its infancy, really, as a technology, but there are various techniques. And actually, for many years, Germany has had a small store um, which is compressed air, the um, Hunthof, Hunt or Hunthof in Germany, has this compressed air store. So you sort of squash the air down. Uh, and then you let it out <laughs> and it turns turbines. That's the basic technology. Um, and of course, if you've got suitable places, but this is not, you know, you can store it in, t in form, the form of water up a hill. But of course, you have to have the hills first. Um, so you, you, know, you, pump, you pump it uphill, and then when you need it, you let it down through turbines. Uh, and all systems have that, but uh, Switzerland obviously is better placed in that than on some other countries. All systems have that, but, uh, but if you, you, you know, and that's currently used, I mean, we have one in Britain that's used, for example, at half time in football matches. Um, but uh, you can't just create them out of nothing. I mean, people have all sorts of madcap schemes for doing this, that the, the, the they, I think they, they think, well, we could run a, we could run a train up an artificial hill and let it down again. But, uh, but there, there are various storage technologies. But largely speaking, these work on the arbitrage principle of filling them when it's cheap and letting it out when it's, uh, when, when it's expensive. But of course, if the, if the gap decreases, that reduces the, the potential for arbitrage. But Mike, isn't this the age-old problem of lots of renewables? That is, as far as I, I would guess, everything from these forms of storage to battery power, they've long been the constraint on stuff like wind and solar. So for instance, I mean, you basically can look at solar prices as partially reflecting progress in storage. Mm -hmm. if, if you have serious storage improvements on any margin, solar pr prices are going to come down, or at yeah. least demand. But the fact that solar prices don't come down means that the market is not anticipating major improvements yeah, and, in storage. And, yeah, and, and actually it's a little bit worse than that because if you, if you guarantee storage of price, which is the current European system, mm. then they don't face any of that. You know, if you say, well, whatever you produce, whenever you produce it, you get so many euro cents per kilowatt hour, then they face none of that trade-off. Right, but it's more than that. That is to say, in a non-subsidized fashion, mm. you would expect a genuine breakthrough in storage anywhere in the world, say China or the yeah. United States, to immediately be reflected in terms of demand for these things. The fact yes. that you don't see it even, except in places which have these artificial subsidies and regulations, such as Germany, um, with such high baseload costs of non-nuclear alternatives, is again testimony to the fact that, say, unlike natural gas production in the US, which is clearly viable, that these are stopgap measures. Yeah, I mean, to, to put it another way around, um, you know, it, it destroys the, the fact that they're paid constant prices destroys the economics of storage. You know, that's just another way of putting around what, what you say, that, that actually storage would look much more viable if renewables faced the costs of their variance. Because 
Um, so it, pr it provides, for those countries primarily reliant on solar, and, and um, so particularly southern European countries, you know, Spain, Italy, uh, it provides lower incentives to invest in storage. And another thing that people talk about is, well, what can, what we, what can we do? Well, we can move to electric cars and we can charge them at night. That's the wrong thing to do. Completely wrong in this system. But, you know, because you're, there, you're then, rather than using the nuclear-based load, you're, you're, you're burning a lot of brown coal, which is <laughs> the dirtiest stuff of all. <laughs> <laughs> This is, of course, dependent on the German system, but what we see in Belgium is that uh, at night, electricity prices are zero mm. because usually the wind blows right, and yeah. nobody is using. Yeah. So this electric car metaphor is usually used, used for this in Belgium. That, look, no. if everybody loads the car at night <laughs> and you drive over the day, it, it's going to solve uh, yeah. some of no. the problems. Uh, this is obviously situation-specific at yeah, yeah. this point. Yeah. Yeah. If it happens, as it does in Texas, I think, that it's mainly windy at night, then, then storage is much, particularly if, it, if the wind faces real prices, yeah. storage becomes that, much that more Then this viable. works. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, that does depend, as I say, well, it, it leads to a more interesting general issue about what an appropriate portfolio of renewables you want. Not just whether you want renewables just for the sake of it, whatever they are, but what would be an appropriate portfolio of renewables given the, temper the, the climate conditions in your country? You know, that, that in, if in countries where it's windy at night, you would want uh, much more storage than in countries where it's windy during the day, for example. But it, you know, people haven't really talked about these issues. They just talk in very broad terms. And so, the more there are more some more general lessons of this. Um, the idea of a single European electricity market um, is, is creates more efficiency. It creates more productive efficiency because you get you get the most efficient technology, marginal technology being used at any time. It creates greater allocative efficiency. Um, it smooths prices and it creates security of supply. So other countries, I'm not saying that Germany is a sort of bad boy in here. Germany actually creates big benefits for other countries by being an overproducer in general. And, and you know, the French system couldn't operate by itself on 70 or 80 percent nuclear, that just wouldn't work. It has to have these other people who are willing to take up the slack. Or, um, but uh, it, so it provides all this, but there is a downside. And the downside is most obvious in the case of Austria. Um, but it, uh, it significantly impacts other countries. And, you know, th this is in a sense quite a concern because Germany was able to make this decision by itself. Uh, Germany happened to make the sort of most radical decision out of all other countries and, and it's, you know, that's what makes it an interesting experiment to examine. Um, but it has impacts on its neighbours. Um, and the renewable, so both the renewable subsidies and the nuclear phase out have a significant impact on its neighbours. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it demonstrates the importance of, of thinking deeply about the coming harmonisation of European energy policy. For example, you know, if you have capacity markets in some countries but not in others, what decisions are people going to make? Um, you know, they, where a power plant is going to be located, where it's, it, it's important. If you, if you harmonize the, you know, if you produce, create some significant, sufficient interconnectors to connect all the countries together, you also have to have a harmonization of the other policies, otherwise you get stupid decisions being made on a single country basis. Anyway, 
I think that's, that's pretty much um, what I wanted to say. Uh, so we've got a bit more time over for questions. Uh, or I can show you some other graphs, but I don't expect you want to see um, those. So um, again, the German perspective, I think we think that it's a long-term investment that we... Yeah. Do you think this long-term investment into renewables will pay off? So that means maybe, well, we have to pay the price now, but in 20, 30 years when uh, the European energy market is well integrated, we found ways to do, the, to do it more stable that in the end it will yeah, well, pay off economically? Um, possibly. I mean, you're, you're sort of banking on a number of things, really. I mean, largely speaking, you're, you're banking on the idea that, that the renewables will go down in price sufficiently um, through whatever mechanism, and if, if, they go, if they go down in price, and if they face the real, the real costs of being producing at some times when, it's, when electricity would be cheap anyway, and at other times, um, then you know, that will make storage more attractive as a technology. Um, so you know, there is the potential there, but, but you know, they eventually, I mean, it will be at least 20 years, if they've given a 20 year guarantee, it will be at least 20 years before they face those price signals. Um, and, you know, but eventually they will have to face them, or otherwise you know, you're not really buying anything very much, I think. Yeah. One question I have as general, so you have this effect on prices mm. uh, in other countries, mm. but I, I think about the general literature on free trade. Mm -hmm. Of course, consumers in other countries are going to pay more, but consumers in Germany are going to pay less. Mm -hmm. but yeah. compared to no trade, and the producers in the foreign countries are going to earn more profits. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, so the welfare benefits is going to be positive. It's a classical free trade. Uh, so, so what is wrong with this reasoning? That's my question, really. Because you stress the negative effect well, on consumers, yeah. but there's going to be a positive effect on the French producers. They're going to earn more money, and French consumers pay some more, but the local producer gains more than the consumers lose. So, so why is it a problem? Um, I'm not sure. Why, why is it that the local producer gains more than the consumers lose? Be because the, the, lo the French producer is going to charge the local consumers more, but, but his is increase it? in profit will exceed that because he will also export more at a higher price. Um, so that's the, 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 not necessarily? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it's quite as straightforward as that. It, it probably isn't, but... but, but, uh, but my, I mean, because it's not like we're moving from a situation of autarky to trade. It's, it's, we're moving from... Less a, to more a, trade. We, yes, yes. And, and, I mean, there are no obvious theorems in trade theory, as far as I know, about, about multi-country move from a certain amount of trade to more trade. Uh, let me rephrase the question. You were suggesting the welfare implication is negative. No, but well, since there's no model, it's not, that's not clear either, right? <laughs> no, no, okay, yeah, yeah. No, it, it may be so, yeah. Okay. yeah. I wanted to make a different point, which is that presumably one of the reasons for both regulating carbon and subsidizing renewables is to encourage innovation mm. in renewables to drive down the price. Yeah. But as your point, as your discussion highlighted, in some sense, if you think about, say, just solar, there are two big constraints in solar. One is the efficiency of receptors, like panels, and conversion from solar energy, reception and conversion of solar energy into some other form of energy. And the second is storage, right? But as yeah. you pointed out, the subsidies are basically helping Germany produce, use more electricity, but the mechanisms you have are undercutting the incentives to improve storage. Yeah. So what I would like to sort of see is the calculation of, forgetting about the question of whether it will innovate, what's the net incentive to innovate in the German system, figuring out both the parts of the system that encourage innovation and the parts that discourage innovation. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that, that, I, that would, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Can I pick up on that? I mean, I think what, John, you're saying, <clears throat> there, is, there is the externality we're trying to fix, which is the carbon one, but there's another externality, which is the innovation one. So from just the carbon, we know that there is a negative externality on the world and the consumers as a whole. On the other hand, there is positive spillovers from innovation. So the way to do this, I think, is on the one hand, you have the subsidies to solar, but then you also have to fix the innovation externalities by direct subsidies to research. And, the, and, and that's the only way to do it, because unless you, unless you encourage research directly yeah. now... Yeah, and actually, I, I, would, I would disagree with that in the following sense, that the way that we fix the system is by saying, well, OK, we'll subsidise this. And then you say, well, we'll subsidize that. I didn't say that. No, no, no. I, I know, said, no, I said I, direct I, subsidies to innovation. I didn't say to what innovation. No, there, is, okay. there, is this, there is this big kind of idea that we have to pick winners. I didn't say we have yeah. to pick winners. We, have to, we just have to direct um, subsidies to clean innovation. It doesn't matter what it is. That's the sort of thing that the market yeah. can decide. Yeah. No, I, I was making a slightly more general point about the way that the electricity market is developing. If you think about it, um, yeah, we had a market where it was essentially, with coal and gas, it was largely market operate, and nuclear, it was largely market operation. We then moved to say, okay, we'll subsidize wind and solar. We then moved to say, okay, we'll pay people for capacity. Um, you moved to say, well, we'll pay people for innovation in storage and etc. cetera. Uh, what, what, is it, what you're doing in, as a whole is subsidizing something which is creating negative externalities overall. And really, you know, you, that, that's not sensible. It's, um... In fact, I would make the point more strongly. One of the problems is, given that the political economy of the way regulatory arrangements on production are made, such as the way in which they're handling storage, it is not easy to identify what is a net subsidy. That's, that's my point. So you can ima imagine a world in which what you really need for renewables breakthrough is a big change in storage. But if you do it in such a way that the value of being in electricity is high, but the value of developing new storage is low, you may actually get very perverse results. Another way to think about that is in the United States, you may want to lower consumption of say, car of gasoline by cars, but the cafe standards, which force car companies to sort of have a fleet miles per gallon, often has the perverse effect of making them actually waste, become wasteful by producing inefficient small cars so that they can sell their more profitable trucks. So they actually, on net, get people to sort of drive more in some ways. So I think you're right. I mean, if you take the actual message that measures they're in a place and account. I mean, I, 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 I was more going for the, if there were a fixed carbon price, you're fixing one externality. And then by having the research subsidies, you're fixing the other externality. But you're right. I mean, in a kind of broad, I mean, this is a nice illustration of this kind of bigger political economy picture of electricity yeah, it, it, It's a series of piecemeal solutions when really you need to think about the bigger, bigger question. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Well, yeah, then and, and, and just, just to say, just to add to that, I mean, th this is a very unfortunate thing, but, you know, people don't like windmills. <laughs> so you have to put them offshore where it's very expensive. And, you know, they, I mean, that, in a sense, everyone loves electricity. Everyone takes it for granted, but they don't want to see it. Yeah, I mean, in Britain, for example, as you'll know, the, the people in the southeast of England don't see it being produced. It was fine when it was produced up, <laughs> up in Yorkshire. But, you know, when they, when they start seeing it on their hills, they hate it. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's one of these sort of sad things about people that, that they want the benefits of the stuff. In my backyard. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. But they don't want to see it. And uh, it, it's a sort of disappointing thing about human nature. Anyway, <laughs> that's perhaps a way to finish. <laughs> well, thank you very much.